looking to accessorize? Check out steamywonders.de for steampunk inspired jewelry, gadgets and other handmade items. Radio Retro Future. Uh, okay, so we should be good to go. Uh, and we've got a full room here at Lexicon Lounge today. Welcome everyone, the citizens of Antifort. How are you all doing? Good, how are you? Great. Yeah, well, doing good. Glad to be here. All right. So we have a very uh, busy group uh, today. Um, so I'm going to try and, and keep it as structured as, as possible. Um, but uh, yeah, let's uh, start with uh, some minor introductions first, uh, starting uh, with the gentleman on the, my left. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Nathaniel Flint of the Landship Scorpios. Uh, I got my own channel, the Landship Scorpios, as well as a writer with the Citizens of Antiford. All right. Lucas? Uh, yep, I'm Lucas Mary the Buford, and I am one of the founders of the Citizens of Antiford. Uh, I made the website, and I do some writing and other uh, other things for the uh, community. I'm Phineas Cromwell. All right. And I'm Abigail Beatrice Cormacken, also right. with the Citizens. Yep. <laughs> All right. And what, 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 uh, do you have a particular role uh, in the citizens of Antifort? Or uh, um, so the the three of us, uh, Lucas, Finn, and I, um, we consider ourselves the founding members of the group. Um, uh, the group has has definitely grown past the three of us, something more than we can handle. Um, so we invited a lot of friends and um, new members in, and it's become a very big community. Mm -hmm. All right. So we kind of handle the community management and some of the more businessy side of things for the rest of the group. I, I in particular, handle a lot of the business aspects of it. Uh, All right. So uh, how many uh, members does your community have right now? Well, I guess there's a difference between active members and how many... You know, yeah, account, you know, as how most many... communities yeah. are. Mm -hmm. so we probably have somewhere around two dozen active members. At any time, yeah. At, at any one time, yeah. uh, though we actually just hit 100 accounts on our website, so. With oh, right. yours. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is a good uh, question uh, for you, uh, Lucas. Um, so tell us a little bit about what are the citizens of, of Antifort and how did it get started? Sure. Uh, a group of us who were hanging out in college were getting into steampunk and we went to a few different talks at some conventions and we decided that I think the best way for us to build out our characters was to create a world um, and then put our characters in that world together. Um, and so we had a bunch of tea parties and we just talked and world built. It started out as a, we had a forum at first, a free forum where we wrote some of this stuff down. Then at some point I started getting into building websites and so it moved from there. A lot of what we do is world building and a lot of our members do writing. There are there is some definitely some some crafters and prop makers and people who are interested in more about this part of it and or that part of it. We we generally are about creating characters that share a world together and what we can kind of do you know, the, the creative stuff that comes out of being able to, to play within a sandbox, right? We, we kind of give ourselves the box to think outside of. Um, <laughs> we need the box in the first place, so we built the box. So, Holding the box. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of what we are, is we, we do a lot of uh, writing and world building, and we do a lot of community events together. So it's, oh. it's a nice, you know, uh, kind of family of steampunks. Um, where we kind of have this Ouija board of a world where it just kind of doesn't, it moves in the direction that everyone's pushing it, not any one particular person. All right. Uh, can it be compared to, for example, uh, well-known websites like SCP, if you're familiar with that? I'm not sure I'm, I'm as familiar with that one. That's Is that the, the one with the monsters? Yes. I don't know. I, I, I'm not as familiar with it. I, I haven't... I would say uh, n not exactly. Um, so in a way, uh, I, I, see, I see where you're getting at with it, um, where there is that shared canon, and they do have, if you, if you saw on the, on the website, they do have an encyclopedia where things that are canon can be found 
in more of a kind of book learned, like encyclopedic way, but it's not exactly like SCP. Um, I would say a little bit more, uh, actually that's unfair because I'm not sure how things are made canon in the SCP, but I would say it's a little bit more um, researched and a little bit more of, uh, of collaborative, but in a way, it I, I, I see where you're getting at where, yeah, anybody who joins and writes and really puts effort into it can have an effect on the canon because they're building in this collaborative world. Um, mm-hmm. So in a way, yes, it, it's, it's similar where there's that set canon and if you try hard enough, you work hard enough with it and with the, with the other members, you can have influence on that canon and create your own town, character, things, even as far as countries, and develop those countries and have an effect on those canons. All right, Uh, for the next question, I don't know who the best person is to ask, but who who can tell me uh, something about, like, the world of of Antifort itself, uh, about its history, and then, yeah, what kind of, what, what its main themes are? Someone is pointing at the camera down below. So yeah, so pointing at us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's that. That's a bit of a loaded question. There's... Oh, we can summarize. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> we went uh, full Tolkien, which is uh, our term for uh, starting from scratch. Um, we have sort of like fantasy races, but not in the way of like elves and dwarves. So we, we have humans who are from one continent. We have native races, uh, which are the Vibrani and the Yeti, which are not hairy giant creatures. They're just more like <laughs> Canadian Vikings. Yeah, Canadian Vikings. Is a good <laughs> but, yeah, not all Yetis. Yeah, not all Yetis. But as far as, as far as when we got started, as, as Lucas was saying, we had we, we put we created a world to put our characters yeah. into, and we created Antifer, just a country for for them to exist in. Mm-hmm. But what creates good storytelling is conflict, and what better conflict than a country that you were just previously at war with? Right, exactly. Yeah. Second country, but you don't just have two countries; you have a trading partner as well. So we created a third country, and a fourth country, and a fifth country, and suddenly we had. A dozen two continents on two and... continents, <laughs> and it was it, it just blew out yeah. of proportion because we realized that the actual worlds are the you know a real world is more complex than. than you know, yeah. um, so, but the, the the core story of the country of Antifred there is that we had this monarchy and things were going okay, and then we went through a war, and that war destabilized everything. So we went through this revolution and the technocrats took over for the monarchs and they ushered in this new era of steam and might and technology and well yeah they're politicians so i'm um, a little bit kind of evilish over. right monarchs. took over for mm-hmm. the monarchs seems a uh, seems very <laughs> passive they executed the monarchs sure yeah. it was a revolution yeah and so a lot of our a lot of our characters had their stories kind of start after the revolution and kind of like, all right, so this is the new age of steam that we have, where we have steam powered automatons built by yours truly. Uh, We have airships and all these other sorts of things. And it's like, all right, go, Um, here's the world and and that sort of thing. So so that's kind of the basis for the story of of our, uh, of Antifert. Um, Another key thing about Antifert, the namesake. Um, So Antifert is actually a desert country um, we did this primarily because being a, a person who relies on steam power, um, water is a very critical element. Um, right. So in order to introduce more conflict into to help story writing, uh, we placed it in a desert. So right, right, where, right. where there's a country with no rivers, you can't ford anything. Yeah, so you know uh, in what other fiction they did that too? A couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also did it in Lost Exile, uh, where they oh, they did okay. that. Uh, they did that too. Uh, there, they have, for those airships, they use uh, Claudia. However, Claudia needs to react with water, and yeah, that that planet also seems to have a water problem because their uh, what was it again? Their climate control uh, mechanism, their terraforming device was on the fridge. So uh, that's that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, we um we also have our politicians, the technocracy, um, the government kind of controls who can have like these water technology. Like mm. there are a lot of people who have like air wells and sort of things, but like 
it's illegal to have your own water condensers, yeah, like, because yeah. the government wants to control the dispersion and, like, distribution of water and that sort of thing. So you get that sort of um, political thing going on. Wonderful. So. Oh, God, yeah. So, uh, what, what was your main inspiration? Where, from what types of fiction, you already mentioned Tolkien, from what, what other types of fiction did you get your, your inspiration? Well, oh, I, I would say all of us kind of pull from our own inspirations. Uh, a lot of things do come from H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, and a little bit of Isaac Asimov. Yeah, I had been doing a lot of world building uh, previously. I had basically finished a world building group and that kind of petered off before this started off. So um, I've been doing a lot of that specific type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of base my, my character has a lot of like, I build a lot of robots and they all kind of have a bit of a Pinocchio story going on. Um, but there's there's a lot of little um, little nods to different stories that we all enjoy. Um, we do try to limit the sort of, um, there was a lot of people writing multiverse everything characters when we first got into steampunk. And we tried to um, insulate our world a little bit from that. Um, and we created a mechanic where there was one island where there were wells that you could do that sort of travel in in a limited way to allow it, but to just control it a bit. Um, but the wells have a bit of uh, Narnian inspiration, thanks yep. to... It's Magician's Thanks, Nephew. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. The, uh, Well Island is basically uh, the, the scene in Magician's Nephew where it's a glade with stu still pools of water, except the water is portals to other worlds, similar to the book. Um, but in our world, things can come in and out, so you have some Lovecraftian creatures that come out of the wells to like come and die on the island, basically. <laughs> Um, yeah. But it's about how travelers go in and out of our world. All right. So we can kind of have a sane maintenance of canon uh, yeah. while still kind of allowing that sort of visitors from other dimensions type of thing. Because people want to want to do that. They want their character to, you know, visit our world. And it's like, okay, we, we want to allow it, but we still want to be able to have that kind of yeah. shared canon we've been working on. Um, right. So that's, want, what, that's want, the way we handle it. Yeah, we want your character to visit our world. We do not want his nuclear-powered airship with laser guns to glass an entire country because you thought it would be funny to steal an emerald and then you leave. Like, all that kind of stuff that happens or used to happen in our community. It's just like, ah, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> right, right. So that there is a kind of uh, editorializing, I, uh, yes. I notice. How do you do that? How do you manage that? Without, you know, getting in all types of fights and... <laughs> Without? <laughs> no. No, like, there's, there's stories that enter, uh, that are... Any story can really be posted as a non-canon, just a story within the world. And then there's a, there's a process for applying for canon that we review the story and make sure that it doesn't break the world or, or whatnot. Um, we certainly do get into arguments. A right. lot of arguments. <laughs> But it's all very yeah. amicable. And, and anything you write on the site, it's not non-canon by default. It's questionably canon. And then if you want to, you say apply for canon, and then we have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And we're right. saying, okay, we like this. Maybe this doesn't work as well because it affects... A lot of it is, has to do with the societal impact. Like, it's like, okay, so you have a death canon. Why doesn't everybody build a death cannon? Yeah, and then exactly. it's death cannons everywhere. I, I um, currently am yeah. working on an episode on steampunk technology where I deal with exactly that question. Yes. So yeah. I mean, and and, and we it's it's very amicable and it's a very collaborative process. And we're like, okay, well maybe your character can have a death cannon, but maybe it's like one of the most expensive, silly things, and nobody would invest the money in building it except for your character, who's rich and mad. Like maybe yeah. it works in your circumstance and we work with you to figure that out that sort of thing um yeah, a good a good uh, example of this i think is actually what what kind of happened with me uh yeah, yeah. They, sure they, they recruited me for the landship scorpius and they said your landship would be perfect in our world so i said okay well then you know uh uh flint moves to antiford and this will be the story and they go uh, they i started ex like you know, talking about it and getting excited, and they went like, uh, like the landship Scorpius is a battleship on legs. So they went, 
whoa, no, it can't be that big. And I went, what do you mean? They're like, how, how is it powered? How are you going to, you know, power such a huge thing? And then they were like, no, we want to know the physics behind this, that, and the other thing. We want to know the this, like, where's your research of why this works? And I went, but it's steampunk. It's, it's like, we're like, I don't need to explain it. How does steampunk work? Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to explain it if it's fun. And they were like, absolutely not. So what ended up happening is it got smaller and it got um, a little bit better. I was able to do research on how things like this work, like how a battleship, like a boat is powered and how I would transfer that into a walking machine and how I would do this and how the digging works and blah, blah, blah. But the biggest one was the, was the rail gun because I didn't want a giant cannon because they're kind of a little bit farther back in time than the land ship Scorpius cannon. So uh, on the Scorpius II, I did like a rail gun and they went, no, absolutely not. It's, it's... Hold on, that was, that was me. <laughs> so, so he basically, we, it, it started a series of fights that um, <laughs> basically resulted to when you do the research, rail guns barely exist in our time now we're not going to let it fly. And it eventually led into a bunch of pseudoscience and, and, uh, and, uh, experiments on basically making a tornado gun that shot stuff instead of being a rail gun. And they went, we can work with this. This is okay. And I think I also got past some of it by making it well te technology that kind of came back and didn't work as well in our world. Um, so someone had like disassembled something from some other world and then rebuilt it in our world. So it's not perfect. Um, and that eventually they were like, okay, we'll do that. And since we've kind of worked that out, it's not overpowered. Like it's not going to be this major, like killing death machine in the middle of the desert. Um, it's, it's not, I guess it's not practical but it's like something emotionally important to my character and the story, right. like his origin story of him kind of building it and having that adventure at the beginning makes it a very uh, emotional thing that he takes care of. So even though it's a little bit impractical and expensive, he is now living a more, I guess, impoverished lifestyle, basically always on the job, um, kind of a la Firefly to keep his dream alive of being able right. to travel on this thing and uh, on, the, on his land ship. And it's a lot smaller. It's a lot more well thought out. I know how that works way better than I've thought through the land ship Scorpius. And the work that I used on that, I was able to carry over into my land ship Scorpius cannon. So I actually did a little more work into how that all works. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it kind of works with this, here's this grand thing I want. And if it's gonna break the world, if it's gonna be like way too, too <laughs> if it's gonna be way too fantastical, um, they say no, or they say eh, and give you big eyes. And then you work, they work with it, with you, you do some more research and you bring that back to the table and say, look, this is why I changed it, or this is why I, I won't change it. Here's my research of why this works. And then it's, it's, a, it's a conversation or it's a shouting match, whichever, you end up getting into first. So uh, I have I have a small example as well. Um, I'm like one of the founding members, and I'm not immune to this sort of thing. I really like writing my stories about robots, and my robots become more and more people-like. And so I was challenged. Yes, by Finn, and he was like, "No, no, no, no! You're making real people." Okay, okay, no, seriously, you need to do something to explain this better. And I was like, fine, challenge accepted. So I went into crazy detail. I'm a software engineer who, who makes uh, software for devices, like, in my day job. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, fine. So I went through all this detail. I mean, yeah, there's still plenty of hand wave. It's still fantastical steampunk, but... I made a basic programming languages that you, it's, it's, uh, like the, my robots are, are run off of player piano scrolls that are their punch card programming. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I made on the encyclopedia page for the script scrolls for the automatons, you can, you can make your own little pretend program. Like I made a pseudo programming language and it was like, 
Bam! That's how they work. <laughs> and I'm so happy with it. Oh, yeah. It's really I'll fun. Bet. I'll bet. So uh, can can people just uh, look into learning this this pseudo programming language on the the Antifort website? Yes, absolutely. Yep, yep. On the encyclopedia, um, there is an entry for script scrolls. Explains a little bit. Um, I could do a better job with the explanation, but it has a little interactive programmer where you can make your own little scroll. Um, okay. So, and I actually even made a physical prop after after using it myself a little bit. Right. Radio Retro Future has been made possible by the Groene Vee Absinthe, some of the best artisanal absinthe from the Netherlands. You can find their selections of homemade absinthe, both white and green, on the groenevee.nl backslash en, or click the link down in the description. So that's probably a, a good segue into uh, how how do you have you got a license uh, for all the fiction that's on the website? Can people use it for themselves? Uh, is there any accommodation for that? Well, uh, I think I, I I actually did put a, a, a license on the site. There is a, a legal section, but basically it says you know share and share alike is fine. But if you want to do anything money-wise with it, then you have to talk with us because we own the right to do any sort of money mm. stuff. Right, but if you're just writing stories and sharing it and being collaborative, um, th th we're not we're not limiting it, um, right? To be honest, so it's it's really about if you want to start kind of, you know, doing business type stuff, you got to go through um, the three of us that order the badger, um, myself right. and then Abigail. But that's that's the only big restriction. Um, the rest of it is pretty much you know collaborate remix. You know, work with us, have fun. All right. Um, so uh, maybe uh, Flint, you already told a little bit about your your character, but maybe you can go into a little bit more depth on what is your character, and we can go through your all your characters and, and what oh. they're like. Yeah, I actually uh, am, am one of the rarities on the website, so I actually have two characters. So uh, my main character that I, I write with, and I do a lot of things through his account is Lieutenant Joel Arnett. Um, so in a nutshell, his his story is that my normal steampunk persona, Lieutenant Nathaniel Flint, accidentally ended up getting like pushed through the wells. And he actually ended up um, being hurt and injured on this island of monsters. Kind of picked up by an airship crew, it's not really said, but he's brought to Antiford for one of their hospitals. And, uh, and that's where he meets. He's confused. He doesn't know what's going on. And there's a lot of men, you know, handcuff him to chairs and shit. So mm -hmm. he fought his way out and, and bumped into my character who helped him escape because he's a little scamp. Uh, he was young and stupid <laughs> uh, in this India. So he um, helps him escape. And eventually they get talking and they realize what happened get back to the island and find his well to to get him back home and through the course of that they end up building a land ship because that's the most you know thing that they they do they they, they justify it in the story but it's not really justified so they build a land ship they get talking um and that character acts as a mentor to this new character and at the end of the whole ordeal uh this uh, Joel Arnett grows to be this um, really this street rat sort of kind of the world and just kind of doing that to kind of, I guess, finding a purpose. And he kind of s says, you know, that's, that's what I want to be. And the rest of his stories and stuff is trying to recapture the magic of that first adventure. So, I mean, he ends up, uh, building onto his land ship that they build and he uh, well at, there's spoilers but he ends up needing to build his land ship again he ends up you know does the same work armored escort service so he will help uh his land ship is is has weapons and stuff on it so he'll actually uh go with you know caravans out to the desert to protect bandits or airship pirates um he'll protect you know trains He'll do uh, small seizures or something and help the police against bandits and the like. He does transport, uh, um, 
things like that nature. And because of the nature of the gun he has, it's uh, got a very long range and it's very accurate. So he actually does a good job of taking out airship balloons. So he kind of specializes in anti-airship combat as a land ship. Um, so he kind of uh, just goes with that. A lot of his stories are just either shenanigans or um, kind of overwhelming arcs. The second character is a little different. He's a detective. Um, it's uh, Kent Nicholas. And, uh, and I did a few stories with him. He was actually technically my first character when I was still playing around with the world. Um, and he's very much the noir kind of seeing the underbelly of the world and, and, and going, oh, this world is just so nasty and it's getting worse. Uh, he's very much a pessimist. Um, uh, in the first stories he's in, uh, then I did a big one with him where I did his origin of how he got into being a detective. And he's a little bit more upbeat in that one. He's a little bit better. Um, but I did my first mystery that I've ever written. And I did it all out where I said, I want people to be able to figure out the mystery. I will always give you all the information. I didn't want to do anything Sherlock Holmes or Perot Ooh, where right. you are kept from certain information to have this reveal aha at the end and go, look, he's a genius because you didn't figure this out, but it's because you didn't have the information. I wrote everything uh, from first person, his point of view and his thought process of trying to put the cogs together and, and, and figure out this mystery and people liked it um so i kind of kept it with him i don't do many of him because i i'm, I'm I, I don't see myself as being a good mystery writer i have been i do have plans for more stories with him and more mysteries that's difficult for me to write um and, and be good at all that action adventure stuff just kind of flows out of me so that's a little bit easier um but that's basically my two characters um and then i do like one-off stories every so often with random people. Um, a lot of the Canterbury Empire stories are kind of just kind of random country instead of about following one of my characters through it. Right. Um, I've got two characters that I write with pretty decently. All right. Uh, the next gentleman. Sure. Um, my character, Lucas Merriweather Buford. Um, he is the um, the the owner of the Buford Automaton Corporation. Um, he sort of lost his arm in the fray of the uh, revolution, and so he had to kind of um, re he rebuilt his arm over the years. And from that expertise, um, he learned how to do robotics. So he moved forward with that, and he had a mentor who not only helped him learn how to do robotic type stuff, um, build automatons, um, be kind of the first person to commercialize automatons in our world. Um, his mentor was also a one of the members of this secret subversive um, society that was kind of fighting against um, sort of the, the ills of the technocracy. Um, and that's how my character Lucas got into the Order of the Badger, which in World um, is that secret society that's kind of fighting for the people. Um, and he does that along with the other two Orders of the Badger below me. Um, and so Lucas's stories are, a lot of them are very emotional. Um, they're, they're very often about his relationship with uh, a new robot he's built. He treats his robots a lot like his children because um, his wife died before he was able to have a family. So he really does treat his automatons as if they were his children. Um, and so that's, so there's a lot of uh, emotional stories going on um, there. Uh, every, every once in a while, I do get to write a fun uh, adventure type story. Like Lucas gets lost in, in an abandoned town and has to fight off uh, goblin hordes, you know, that sort of thing. Um, Goblins being kind of a more uh, chimp-like monster, not like right. an intelligent uh, race or anything in our world. Uh, so yeah, and I, I so I I explore kind of a topic or a theme or a, maybe a writing style that I want to try. Um, usually by 
uh, exploring a robot um, kind of centers around um, that and and Lucas's emotional journey throughout his life. You you make um, him sound uh, a little bit like uh, Tyrell from the the Blade Runner uh, movie, the original one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But, uh, oh. it, any uh, any story involving a creator loving his creation a little too much or accidentally making it come to life, you, you're going to see a lot of lines connect to his character. Yeah. In many of those kind of stories. Right, yep. Right. So. Yeah. Were you uh, were you done? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, next. Uh, next, please. You're me. I'll go first. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, my, my uh, Phineas Caractacus Cromwell, um, an engineer uh, trained under the monarchy, um, and then he, an experiment goes wrong. He ends up destroying his house, and his wife dies in the process. Yeah, my dead wife. Um, he, <laughs> he then... Um, refuses to turn over the experiment that he was working on to the to the engineers in the government, and they arrest him and throw him out in a penal colony um, through a series of I guess misfortune unfortunate events. <laughs> series of misfortunes. He ends up actually getting out of the penal colony and makes his way to the coast with a new friend and uh, who would become his first mate, uh, Boric, who's a Yeti or half Yeti. Um, and then he kind of turns into a, he uses his engineering skills to produce water. He builds some water condensers illegally and um, makes a small fortune that way. And then builds an airship and becomes more or less a pirate. So he does there's, there's like illegal to... water trade going on, I uh, I understand. Yeah, of course there is. And he doesn't like the term pirate. He doesn't think of himself as one, but yeah, from my perspective. <laughs> yeah, don't call him Captain. Oh, Commodore. He has several ships <laughs> in his command. <laughs> Pirate King. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's really most of it. Mo um, most <laughs> of the that I write are more of an action adventure science fiction. Um, mainly because that's, that's most what I've read. Um, I guess besides high fantasy, most of what I've interacted with is is the actiony science fiction. So you you write what you read. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. Well, then, uh, as you write what you read, um, and in the few stories that I have written, I am not a very good writer. I actually do most of the art for the site, so and a lot of research. Um, so I generally do that. But um, my character, Abigail Beatrice Cormack, um, she was uh, what we call tinkers. Um, are um, traveling caravans out in in the desert. So she was she was born to a very poor family, um, and through a very strange interaction, she got to meet um, someone through the wells, and uh, she basically stole a chemistry book, um, and through another series of unfortunate events, uh, she found herself in Gearford, which is the main city in Antford, and uh, with a very large distaste for rich people. So I like to read a lot of uh, horror <laughs> and uh, um, that sort of thing. So I'm I'm really into the seedy underbelly of the Victorian era. Uh, so Abigail is very into um, like making concoctions, going to opium dens um, and slowly poisoning rich people and taking their money. So, um, I created Abigail more as a uh, statement that like a lot of people who are in steampunk like to be heroes and they see themselves as good people. And I feel like in order to have a balanced story, you definitely need people who are not quite anti-heroes 
and not quite villains, um, but dealing with people who are overly unpleasant with unpleasant situations because some mm. people like to, some people <laughs> like to read that sort of stuff. Oh, um, no. So some of my stories have to do with like body horror and um, and addiction and all that not fun stuff. <laughs> all right. So uh, we uh, I, I, I I asked you to to tell this so people have an idea of what 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 steampunk characters can be like um, because there are a lot of questions on that. Um, so yeah, well, what what to you I guess? How would you suggest? Uh, somebody who's new to steampunk, how to create a steampunk character? Well, what routes do you suggest? Um, well, one of, one of our favorite um, exercises early on, especially, um, was we would take a profession, you know, look in an encyclopedia or roll a dice to find just a random profession mm -hmm. and then add steampunk to the beginning of it. Oh, hey, there's a, a mailman. A steampunk mailman. Oh, maybe they have their own little personal airship that they go around and deliver mail. You know, uh, so yeah, that that was one of my favorite things to just be like, all right, let's pick a random profession and what would it be in a steampunk world? Like, what kind of gadgets and tools and fun creative things would make that job that maybe mundane um, steampunk? What would you know? What would a uh, uh, steampunk garbage man? look like would he have some crazy compactor backpack like you know a steampunk chef that sort of thing so that, that was one of my favorite ways of, of kind of looking at it um i didn't use it for my particular character but I, I had thought about it for a few of a few side characters here and there absolutely um so i don't know uh you want to feel this question yeah. Nate? on uh on with that um i would say just in general making steampunk characters there's, there's those kind of ways of doing it. Um, I think, uh, well, when we, when we talk about our characters, it's more like a persona. So when I think of that, I mean, you're creating them in three ways. You're either making a character who's steampunk you or who you want to be. So that's very individual and you have to find that yourself. You're either making a, it around a prop or around a look that you want to be known for. So you're taking this prop that you made, or you're making this, um, you made, the, and you want to look that way, or you want this thing, and then you're saying, "Oh crap! I need to make a character. Like I have to be a character. So, what kind of character would use this? What kind of character would wear this? What kind of situation it would this be around? Or the third one, what kind of story you want to tell? So, do you want to be the noir detective?" And then you have to make everything around the fact that you want those gritty girls. Or do you want a character who is lucky, happy-go-lucky and travels the multiverse, jumping from, from you know, portal to portal and uh, and showing up and Doctor Whoing it and, and, and being amazing and, and everything that they do and, and fixing all the multiverse's problems just because that they can. And once you figure out what kind of story you want to tell, you end up saying, okay, well, what's a person who would do that? Or what is a vessel to tell that story? Um, so those are, I kind of feel everything, every way that someone has come up with a character fits in one of those three avenues of, of you know, it's steampunk me or it's a steampunk blank. So some other character, it's a prop or a costume or it's a, you know, what kind of story you want to tell. In the end, it's just thinking about it. And as you, you know, take in different things and research, you end up finding that path of what you want to explore and what you want as a character. I would say as writing a character, like not just a persona that you want to be a part of, steampunk characters, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of things. Um, I think people think a little bit too much into the, oh, well, I'm writing this kind of story. How do I have a steampunk character in it? General character. It's the same rules for background characters and, uh, and protagonists and stuff. You're just putting them, like steampunk is, is more of the setting. Um, again, like you can blow off your character's arm and have a steampunk arm. That's not a steampunk character. That's, he has a mechanical arm. 
going into a, a steampunk character is more of just writing a, a normal character and then, you know, adding steampunk elements to them or their setting and how they, you know, live in that world or interact with that object. And, and to that, thinking of the details of the world would affect that character. Um, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the minor, and minor details of the world will change. I'm getting feedback. <laughs> yeah, uh, so do I. We didn't have that uh, just now. Um, for some reason, uh, oh. can you, can you, t no, wait, no, you can't turn down the volume. Um, hmm. No, oh, let's try. Maybe it will, uh, will, uh, will dissipate. It happens. All right. Um, well, okay. Uh, so the, some, sometimes the minor details within the world affects how the character develops. Um, if you know if they exist in a and, and it's much like like what um what was being said that it's about the story that you want to tell um create creating that world will have an impact on the character if you you know if it's a utopia versus a you know a dictatorship that's a there's going to have vastly different impacts to the character well, like yours, let's take your character. Okay. Your character, uh, you know, kind of came into his own during the monarchy. So he was very shaped by the monarchy and kind of owes them for a lot of his education and success. Very different look at the the new technocracy than some other characters like, um, oh, uh, like a Rathchild's person who is a successful businessman from a successful business family who is now in a lot of power right. during the monarchy um, even though he's he's kind of unliked by the other people of power um, he's very much like now in a very uh, undisputed amount of power that he didn't have before so those two characters just that little again minor detail alone a revolution happened and now we have a different form of government they both have vastly different feelings towards that which affects their characters i mean your character became a water pirate or a, an airship pirate who's kind of always on the run from that government while his character became kind of a a sleazy almost overnight instead of just being a gritty mill owner i mean actually one of my favorite stories is to tell is when lucas and i were on the phone it was years ago and we were yelling at each other we and look, we were trying to decide how the technocracy actually was. Were they, from my perspective and from Finn's perspective, they were evil. They they were doing a bad job for the city. Kind of, they were manipulating things so that they could get wealthy and hold power. And Lucas was more on the side of they're good people. They're no, just, no, 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 no. I was on the side of I thought that the system of technocracy was a great idea. And Lucas does pretty well in the system, to be honest, even though he's in the Order of the Badger fighting against it. Um, however, I just thought that the people who were in charge were terrible people, and that it was the, the government was bad because of the people who were running the system, not the system itself. And you were trying to argue that, no, the system itself was terrible. And we were arguing back and forth, and then we both stopped. <laughs> that we were yelling at each other over the phone. And then we both stopped dead silent and started laughing because we just invented politics within the world. Right, now, yeah, exactly. That is, that is exactly what it sounds. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's also an important uh, trait of a character, right? Well, what are his philosophies? Uh, what are his principles? Does he care about principles? Or yeah. is he just all uh, exactly. just just pragmatism, and and I think that especially uh, in the political and social climate we are living in now, especially on the internet, right? Yeah. We see a lot of yeah. people that, that 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 have all these these wonderful ideals. But however, when it comes to their own principles, they don't have any. So <laughs> those uh, principles only apply to other people, but not themselves. So. Um, and 
a, a, a quick little spin about my character is that my character started as this kind of like pure super pacifist like he's a he means super well and he's like super green and he's gonna do all the things and over time partly because of the collaborative nature of our world where it's not just me writing these stories it's everyone writing these stories and some people writing stories with my character in it mm -hmm. my character kept doing things that weren't necessarily the best like they were always like not necessarily the best <laughs> you know they were always so excusable, but so like horrible. my character was not you know, blameless yeah, anymore geez. Right. Um, my character basically became Lando Calrissian, like, it's not my fault! It's not my fault! Like, well, it's clearly his fault. Um, so that evolved over time because of the nature of our community and collaborating using our characters. Well, that's, that's uh, an interesting point you, you brought up, like, uh, other people are using your characters, is that... You know, how do you Sometimes, deal with that? Yes. Like, okay, this is something my... Have you ever come across situations like, okay, this is something my character would just not do? Yes. yes. Um, generally, people are very, very respectful when they do a collab. They'll talk to you, they'll ask you first. Um, it, it's kind of the common courtesy is, hey, I'd like to write a story with your character. You usually let them in on the, the rough drafts and you get their approval. Like, hey, does this sound like your character? Maybe can you rewrite some of the dialogue so it sounds more like you? Um, you know, sometimes we've had rough uh rough interactions where it's like my character wouldn't do that but you've written it so that the plot requires them to do that mm -hmm. and so sometimes there's a give and take and that one of the one of the gives i gave was that my character hired a bounty hunter to kill somebody which is not something i thought my character would do but i allowed it because it made a lot of sense in the story but it did very much change who my character was from then oh, on wow. um, yeah. that's that's a line you cross once you start killing people you you cross a line from which there is yep. no returning, yeah. yeah. So, so you, you end up writing several stories based around that because you wrote something about a competitor and then you wrote something about you were being investigated. Like he had to write several stories to show that this pacifist, like very happy-go-lucky businessman had more stress in his life and more and more pressures. And then he made like a split second, very desperate decision to just make something stop. And then later on, he had to write another story that was after this story that was like, what have I done? Oh no, and he has that grit and, and, and stuff. And I think that kind of turned you into the, you know, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so while, I, while I gave that conceit, it gave me a lot of inspiration to start writing a lot more and be like, okay, why did my character do this? What happened? <laughs> and when, what's the consequence? Yeah, so, so while I gave up a little bit of that uh, original idea, I got a lot out of it creative. Yeah, well, that, that's, the, that's the thing, right, with, with writing stories, is you come across a point where you're like, okay, how, how am I going to solve this? Uh, or you know, it doesn't sound right, or, you know, and then turn it into a strength, turn it into uh, a, a plot point, something that changes the character in, in fundamental ways. And I think that that's one very important part of the writing process. Like you've got a, a great story idea, however, then you start writing and that's like, okay, how do I get my character from that point to that point? And then you, you mm. change the, the course of the story entirely, uh, turning it into a completely different conclusion because... Well, that's, that's writing, <laughs> you know, kill your darlings, yeah. as they call it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, exactly. I think that was actually might make a good transition, because we were talking about how to create a character and now how to use characters in the world. Do you want to talk about what it's like for new people to join the site? Oh, yeah, sure. Sounds good. Well, I guess, I guess, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here, who has joined the site. Okay. <laughs> oh, and, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I guess I brought it up. I guess I better speak. Um, yeah. yeah. So we were talking about what it's like for a new person, especially now on the site, the website, um, citizensofantifer.com. If you're uh, if you're watching, you want to go in there and look at it while we're talking. Um, there's a lot there. There's a lot to do. I like the sound of it. You want to do some desert steampunk. You want to start doing something, and you want your steampunk mailman. Let's keep on that theme. Um, there's a lot that's kind of daunting about the website. There's a lot to read. Um, generally though, we're, we're pretty laid back. 
I would say, I mean, the first thing you got to do is, is make an account. And there's a, there's a bit of an inside joke that's like, you need a name and you need an email. <laughs> like, and, and, and that's, that's important. Don't not have a name when you join the site. Um, but when you, when you join the site and you, you kind of make a character, um, there's a lot of internal stuff that you need to do. Uh, again, like you got to make your character and you got to make them work. Um, but I would, I would suggest for new people to either, uh, uh, like one of us or just someone on the site about your character or do some reading. Um, we were, we're very much a writing collaborative, um, which many writers who join the site don't understand that also involves reading stuff that you might not want to because it might deal with stuff you need to learn about or you need to, to, uh, to, you know, interact with. Um, and we also have the encyclopedia, which is, uh, which is in that top bar on the website. And, uh, the encyclopedia is, is a bit daunting at the beginning because it, it is like a, a Wikipedia where it's just kind of all the articles and, and um, you can definitely start by, you know, clicking into the world and looking at the countries. So you can start with Antifert and branch out from there. You can start with a, um, a professional, well, I, I'm not sure if we have so a professional. If I, if I may interject, uh, maybe. Yep. Um, yep, yep, please do. We, we do have a page if you're not logged in or if you go down to the footer, there's like a, a new here or a getting started page um, that mm. does kind of try to outline a bit of like, hey, so we've got some stuff in the encyclopedia. You might want to take a look at the time because we have different days of the week, that sort of thing. So you don't get lost if you see, you know, it's lie day in, in Moogs. Like, what the heck does that mean? Um, you know, we've got double-sized months, that sort of thing. But then I also go through and I say, hey, you might want to look at some of the major events in the library. You might want to look at some canon things first. You might want to pick an author and then just kind of see if you like that author's stories. And then if you don't, go to a different author, see if you like their stories. Um, yeah, the encyclopedia is definitely more of a, it's a reference tool, but it's like if you want to build yeah. something and you want to know, hey, what's the technology kind of like? Um, generally, uh, we try to put as much as we can in the encyclopedia. We've been trying to go through and, and update that a lot more recently. Um, but like, hey, what's the kind of the gun technology in the world? And there's a page for that. Um, you know, what's what's communication technology? What, you know, what are the telegraphs like in our world? Oh, there's these telegraph houses that translate telegraphs into like letters. That's interesting. Um, so we've got that sort of thing in the encyclopedia. Uh, we generally fall back to, hey, what was the kind of technology of the 1890s if it's not explicitly yeah. written out, but that sort of thing. So we do have kind of a getting started page, um, but I know it, it can't be comprehensive, um, especially yeah. since I, who's living and breathing it all the time, and the one yeah. who wrote that. So, uh, so yeah, feel free to yeah, continue. What, what what I would say is um, is a general rule. Anytime you enter anything collaborative, I don't I, I don't want to like you know stop anyone from being creative and telling the stories they want to tell. But generally, for anything collaborative, I say start small, and when you get an idea for it, build up. So when you join Antifer, don't say, oh yeah, no, I'm the president of this country and. I'm going to do all this, like, you know, I'm going to go to war with this country because I want to tell those kind of stories. It's like, yeah, but now you're affecting untold amounts of people yeah. by, by doing that. I said, or, or don't come in saying, oh, I like the sound of the technocracy. I'm now the head of the technocracy. Right. Like that's, that's getting into issues. There's a whole lot that goes into it. Um, I, I, again, going with the steampunk mailman kind of deal, I, again, Disclaimer, I don't want to stop anyone from being collaborative. And we definitely do have characters who have come into the world and eventually gotten into bigger things of power. Both of the examples I just gave, we, we kind of have. We do have someone, uh, not not someone running the technocracy, but we do have someone who's kind of deals ahead of state. Size. And we do have someone who um, who yeah. is ahead of state, who, who now who is now in control of a country. Um, but, but generally I would say start smaller, get a feel for it. Um, you know, kind of try to figure it out. We have people who have come in and we talk about what, what, what kind of makes us a little different in, in, in our world. There's things like people come in and they're like, I have a, a Tesla lightning gun that turns people into goop. 
uh, that's not really in our world. There, there's no way to do that. It's a little overpowered for what we've established. Um, I would just say start small, get a feel for it. You don't even need to have a character. Get us get an account on the site. Start talking, interacting with us. Um, reading is one of the best ways to get into the world. But I know it's not for everyone, and some of the stories are extremely long. So I can understand that as well. But you you gotta you gotta collaborate. You gotta talk to people. You gotta learn about the world. Doing things like this, going to a panel if we're at a, a a convention near you and we're doing one of our world building or or citizens 101 panels those are great ways to get introduced this video will be a great way to get introduced um to the world if i may interject again um on the the sort of length of stories um it has been become a tradition the past year or two uh thanks to you know uh, nate specifically flash here fiction. um that we have a lot of flash fictions and we've been doing a lot of challenges to write flash fiction. So there's a lot of short, like kind of micro slice of life stories that are easier to uh, consume, right. especially as a beginner. Um, yeah. So you don't necessarily have to get overwhelmed by the kind of new world. Um, you can yeah. kind of take little stories here and there and, and as you as you like. And if you want more stories from that author, well, then you've read 500 words from that author and you can kind of decide if you like their their writing style or their oh, stories yeah. and then you can go further in depth. Um, All right. Um, well, let's go to the, uh, the one of the last final topics. Um, unless you, you can be free to ask me anything uh, too as well if you want to. Um, that same goes for our viewers. You can also comment in the chat if you want, if you have questions for our guests. Um, so besides all the writing, is there any other form of activity you do? Um, with the, with the, or do you have a question for me? Because you see you have your, your oh. finger up. Okay. Uh, so um, are there any other activities besides writing uh, you do on the, on the group? Yeah, well, um, uh, not all of our members are writers, me included. Um, we do have a lot of artists on the site. So if you are not particularly um, apt at writing or a, a don't really want to dive into a, a novel length uh, story, which we definitely do have on the site, thanks to him. Nope, wrong way, that way. Um, <laughs> and um, th we do have a way to add um, like pictures in the, the gallery, so it, or the library. So if you want to uh, draw a picture or we have sculpture artists who take pictures of their works. Um, and we have a, a theater. So if, you, if your medium is video, um, we can add it to the carousel. Mm -hmm. uh, but easy through YouTube. Right, yeah. Uh, so we do our own sort of official uh, Antifred on air and we've done some convention. Uh, we do a lot of conventions. We do a lot of talks at the conventions um, in the New England area, um, especially. But we, so we've done a lot of video and, uh, uh, but we, we've told our members, hey, it's open. If you have a video series that's steampunky or related to something that would fit on the site absolutely we would love to put it in the theater um so landship scorpio's channel over here um he's been taking over for a lot of the event videos and he's been doing his world hat story 101 um so we've gladly put that on our theater we're very proud that our member is doing this really interesting video content and um, hopefully we have a member who's starting to be interesting, interested in doing like a video diary because um, they've expressed that they're not really into the writing as much. Um, and we said, yeah, absolutely, feel free, do a video diary and we'll put it up there. Um, All right. yeah, so. and, and again, he made our website um, and, uh, and it, it, he, he wrote it from scratch. So in the editor, for those kind of things like pictures, adding pictures and adding art and things, but also adding video to a, a set post or a blog post or whatever is very easy. So if your medium is doing things in character, we, we can make that work. Uh, we've, we've worked around some of the tech, technological things to have little bursts of technology. So I think that we've, we've made it characters in world 
at least currently can do some form of blog or, or something um, so that we can have that as a medium for people who aren't exactly writing proficient. Um, I mean, artists are always loved and needed. Um, more visual representation of the world is always loved. Um, you can see a lot of what we have already in the encyclopedia and on the Atlas. If you go to the website and you look at Atlas, I mean, that's all her. Well, and it, it, there's a, the, the, the world map is all um, her. There's some other maps that are done by different members who are focusing on their own particular... Yeah, if you're an artist and you want to redo some maps... <laughs> um, like, the gear is hard. Yeah. 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 yeah there also, I do want to mention there's um there's some art that was on the site that we unfortunately uh, were posted on, on temporary image hosting. So some of the art from our earlier days unfortunately got lost because you know imagers you have to look at it within six month limit. Um, so we are absolutely you know we do still have a lot of the comics and stuff that people made originally that have a lot of in jokes um, from from just our personal meetups and, and joking around about stuff. Um, but yeah, we, we we're definitely looking to have more and more art uh, moving forward to replace some of that art that we lost. That's that's something that we've definitely been looking into. So. All right. Um, okay, well, uh, I, I think uh, we discussed uh, a lot. Um, is there any uh, particular thing you want to uh, discuss, uh, something that hasn't been mentioned, or do you have questions for me? Um, I um, I think that an important thing, especially since we're, we're reaching out to an entire new audience with, with this stream, uh, with, with you helping us with that Radio Retro Future, um, is uh, we haven't really talked about what makes Antifer different from all the other steampunk worlds. Like uh, a lot of, we, we, we get some comments sometimes that's like, well, this is steampunk. Or I mentioned earlier that I was like, but it's steampunk and this is fun. And da -da. Uh, I don't know if the founders want to talk about like specifically what makes Antifer different from say, you know, even some of the people who, who we know, like the Red Fork Empire and stuff, what kind of makes us different from other steampunks or what you would think of as traditional steampunk? Yeah, uh, well, well, first you got to discuss what is traditional steampunk. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, what is yeah. steampunk is, is that's a like, that's like a thing in itself. Series yeah, on exactly. Uh, so I, I think that uh, you wanted to do that, that stream with me, so I, I suggest we save it for then. Uh, because that's that's another big topic we're already over an hour in. Okay. Um, yeah. But I'm 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 glad yeah. to do a second stream of you guys uh, to 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 talk about that subject. Um, oh sure. Yeah, I, I think that would be uh, better because that's another really yeah. big topic. Yeah, um, yeah I think the, the 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 long and the short of it is things like nuclear power, laser weapons. Uh, I guess sky whales is. Is popular. Those kind of things aren't in our in our in our world, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. All right. Do we have uh, questions so, from any of the chats? Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, the chat is really silent today. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, our if, uh, audience isn't chatty. If uh, you don't have uh, any other remarks uh, or, or questions, uh, I guess we can go to the final words of inspiration, which is kind of a tradition here on Radio Retro Future. Um, I'll only give it to one of you, uh, otherwise it's, it's going to be a very long-winded uh, final statement. Uh, so yeah. uh, who, uh, who wants to, uh, to end the stream? And I, Somebody's pointing down. <laughs> Maggie. So I guess my... Uh... Final words are uh, keep on creating. Um, if if you are into something, whether it be collaborative fiction or writing on your own or creating on your own or doing steampunk or playing video games or whatever, keep on doing you. I mean, keep on being creative. Um, so, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to close the stream uh, for uh, today, uh, this Sunday. I'm probably going to post the final version Although I don't think it needs much editing, to be quite honest. Um, but I hope to uh, finish oh, the final version flattered. on Wednesday. Uh, so that uh, will be a good time slot. Um, yeah, otherwise we all, I also hope to publish a new video on a video game, uh, Deluvian. Uh, which is in a bit the different style than I usually do. And of course I'm also working on new episodes of the Steampunk Beginner's Guide and some other movie projects. Uh, which I'm really enthusiastic awesome. about. Unfortunately we had a number of setbacks. So. 
I, uh, I hope to have a regular publishing schedule in a few months um, because these are really long-term projects we're currently working on. Um, so yeah, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will have a pleasant week. And of course, as always, make things your way.